great presentation. And are you successfully seeing my shared screen? Yes, we are. Okay, Perfect. very good. Um, I sounded really important in that introduction. I wish you'd say it again. I just liked hearing it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I've just um, been extremely, extremely fortunate in my life and um, have taken advantage of some opportunities early on. And I tell you, uh, if it hadn't been for a few adults when I was a young teenager, 14 to 15 year old, giving me a little bit of great advice to go into science and get off the football team, um, I would have turned out to be a totally different uh, life than I have now. So my name is Stephen and I live in Atlanta. And I wanted to say hello to a few of my friends who are on, also Lissy Stallman and, and uh, Larry Rosen and several people that have tuned in. I appreciate you guys watching. We are going to talk a little bit today about the barred owl, Strix Verita. My um, subject is actually solar spectroscopy and stellar spectroscopy and solar astronomy. Um, but I really enjoy birding and I really enjoy watching the light and how, how it interacts with birds. So I might bring a perspective that you haven't thought about before, and hopefully we will. Um, I'm going to get right into it because it's, it's somewhat long and I'm going to rush through it uh, until we get to the last couple of parts, which are, are the most interesting. But I was asked to talk about barred owls, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, uh oh, how do I? Is it letting me do it? OK. Uh, that's me. She already read all that stuff. Yeah, I do a lot of, a lot of cool things. Um, and mainly the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project is what I started back in 2010 or so uh, when my friend Charlie, uh, who was a fellow veteran, uh, killed himself over the demons that people have in their lives. And he decided to make that decision. And it kind of gave me an epiphany of, you know, how, how did I get here and why, why am I so fortunate? And, uh, and it, it, like I say, it turned out to be a couple of key teachers and adults when I was young. So I decided I was not going to let another person go by me that was interested in science or nature without me uh, inviting them to do what I do and see if they can get that benefit as well, because it really made an enormous difference. And those of you that are teachers already know all this. And um, those of you that that take people out birding for the first time, you can see it. Uh, you, you can just see it in their eyes and, and showing somebody something new that you love is one of the best things in the world you can do, in my opinion. It's great for you and it's great for them. Um, Lake Apopka is one of my top three favorite birding spots on earth. I think I would rather go there than just about anywhere. And I know that since you all live there and go there all the time, uh, you don't maybe have the same, uh, appreciation for me, but I will do pretty much anything to go spend the, the full day at Lake Apopka and just look around. It's, it's a fantastic spot. I went to nuclear power school in the U S Navy in Orlando and what is now Audubon park. Uh, used to be a big Navy base, and I spent many months there. And uh, at that age, I wasn't uh, I wasn't into birding, and I really missed out. Of course, it probably wasn't there back then. It was probably a waste site. But this barred owl, uh, on my first trip with my camera to Lake Apopka, this barred owl followed me down the end of the of the drive, and I just uh, you wouldn't have believed my excitement. I was jumping up and down. I was screaming like a little girl in the car, I couldn't believe how lucky I was. And I was able to get this fantastic photograph of this barn owl. And um, I really have a soft spot in my heart for Lake Apopka. So I, I uh, appreciate you guys inviting me to uh, speak. Let's talk about the sun just for a second. This is, these are images that I take through my telescopes that I, that I do outreach with and share with students around the world. This is our sun. Uh, the white area is a solar flare. The darker areas are cooler clouds of plasma. Uh, this star is the number one most important thing in the universe to our existence and everything you've ever taken a photo of, every bird you've ever seen, every plant you've ever appreciated, um, each other uh, are all direct results from the existence of this gigantic ball of hydrogen. And of course, we go around it at once a year. Um, this star converts hydrogen into helium through nucleosynthesis and it produces light. Uh, which caused the start of life on our planet. And it took a big chunk of rocks that coalesced around it and gave it just the right energy and just the right wavelengths to allow the evolution of life. Uh, it's a fascinating story. That was a 20 second synopsis of about 50 years of study. But 
um, that bird that you're looking at next time you see it, what you're seeing are reflections uh, of different wavelengths of light coming from nuclear fusion in the core of this star, 93 million miles away. Every single thing on this planet owes its existence to this star. And I really um, love to tell that to people and love to share that story with people because it's fascinating. But that's mainly what I share in my outreach program. And after the 2017 eclipse, um, and then of course with COVID coming in, it changed the face of outreach in the world. You couldn't go to schools anymore. Uh, you couldn't, I used to set up five days a week in schools and show students this, but I had to change to something else. And I loved birding by that time. And I got to thinking, you know, everything in these woods is, is the sun and these beautiful creatures I'm seeing are exactly the same thing. It's light being interpreted by our retina and our rods and cones and being uh, sent to our brain as images, but it's all exactly the same. So I've been teaching the relationship between the two and how animals and plants rely on and use different wavelengths of light coming from the sun. And it's been a pretty successful program. We've had lots of fun. This owl, the barred owl, or owls in general, have been around uh, for 30 to 50 million years. Um, people say that, they throw that fact out loosely. Um, it's mind boggling to think that these animals have been pretty much in their present form uh, 10 times longer than human beings have existed as Homo erectus um, or Homo sapien. It's, it's just unbelievable when you realize the amount of time that these animals have been around, like the great blue heron. Whenever I see one, it's just, oh, it's just a great blue heron. Yeah, but that bird has been in that pond for 30 million years. Uh, we weren't even thought of when these animals were already in their current form and have evolved to be almost perfect in their slot in nature. And these owls are no exception. Uh, there's been fossils of owls dug up, you know, from all the way back to the Pleistocene era. This is a, a 11,000 year old barred owl fossil. Uh, and this is also a good, a good, uh, representation of the fact that barred owls are mostly feathers. I mean, that they, they are very small birds when it comes to it. They're basically a giant set of powerful legs with some feathers on it and a brain, but they're really tiny. And most birds, you know, as, as most of you already know, are about three quarters uh, feathers and one quarter bird. So they're very light and very small animals. The barred owl uh, fossil here is I believe about 25,000 years old. To me, it's just, and look at the size of those, of those legs, you know, versus the rest of the animal. Like I say, it's just a big, powerful, perfectly evolved set of grasping talons that grab something and kill it and eat it. It is designed to consume food with a little bit of afterthought to laying eggs and, and furthering the species. They were named by a doctor in uh, Philadelphia uh, in 1799, Benjamin Barton. I don't think he named them after himself because they are named for their streaks of color on the chest, the bars of color. Barred owls <clears throat> inhabit about half of North America, as you can see from the map. It's probably a little further than that now. Uh, they spread like crazy, but barred owls don't really move much in their entire life. I mean, if you look at tag barred owls and where they've been retrieved, it would be exceptionally rare to be able to um to report a barred owl moving more than seven or eight miles in its entire life uh, they usually stay within a half mile of where they're born maybe a mile and they just slowly spread in every direction um, they are taking over uh, great horned owl is the number one predator of the barred owl and they are losing in the Southeast. So the barred owl is, is pretty much taking over everything because they're so successful and they've adapted so well. There's two types of owls. There's barn owls and everything else, basically. So uh, that's a little interesting fact and that's a whole subject for another lecture. But uh, there's about 200 species of strigidae or owls and then 17 species of barn owls in the world. Um, what do I do and how do I know about these bar barred owls? Um, when I retired uh, from air traffic control in 2014, I had been going to this nature preserve locally and walking around a little bit. And one of the guys that, that volunteered there asked me if I'd help with the project, and I did. And the next thing I know, I'm on the board 
And uh, the next thing I know, I'm in charge. So um, I've been maintaining this nature preserve for about five years now. Uh, it's privately owned. It's called the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve, named after a local guy with lots of money who donated the land to the uh, nature preserve to use in perpetuity. It's 28 acres. It is located just northeast of Atlanta. Um, and it's right in the middle of urban sprawl. Uh, this is the actual lot of the nature preserve. And I guess my mouse pointer is not working, so you'll have to just follow me. But the, um, the, the center of the map there shows the nature preserve and to the upper left is, a, is the pond. We call it a beaver pond, but it's actually an ephemeral pond that's dry half the year and has water half the year. And along the north edge of the preserve is the south fork of the Peachtree Creek. So on all sides, especially the northeast side, there's nothing but urban sprawl, uh, decay, garbage, uh, your, your typical medium income type neighborhood. Uh, there's houses everywhere on the other side of it. There's nothing feeding this pond except rainwater from the local neighborhood. Uh, the Peachtree Creek just goes by the preserve and doesn't, doesn't add any water. Maybe once or twice a year it floods and it will flood the whole preserve. But it's really an unlikely place to have so many species of animals and plants living there. And we, we maintain this preserve strictly for the benefit of wild animals and plant life. It's privately owned, so we don't have some of the problems that a public park would have. We don't have a bunch of picnic tables sitting around. We don't have baseball fields or you know people drinking and stuff. This is a animal preserve and I'm the enforcer. So I take it really seriously. And somebody's in there with a off leash dog or something, they're gonna get a ration from me in a hurry. And because of that, we've been able to maintain a ton of animals, uh, species that you wouldn't expect in the middle of a downtown area. So the trail system is fairly simple. It's one mile of trail. Um, there's a couple of little bodies of water. They're all ephemeral. They all dry up half the year. Um, we've somehow managed to have 179 species recorded uh, in the last five years in this, in this tiny little uh, oasis of wildlife. Uh, I find that amazing. Of course, for Orlando, that's, that's probably nothing for you guys, but for us, this is, this is a pretty special place. I'd say it's uh, easily in the top five uh, best birding spots in the state to go. And um, it's really easy to get to, and, and we really uh, make it friendly for bird watchers and animal lovers. Um, the barred owls have been there since I started. Uh, and the things I've noticed about them is uh, this is just, you know, I know a lot about the barred owls at Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. This may not match up with Orlando, but where I live, you start hearing the owls in uh, late December, around Christmas, early January. Uh, the male shows up first, uh, waits on the female. You know, they're monogamous. They mate for life. Uh, you'll hear the caterwauling. You'll see the male sitting up in a tree. Uh, he's already picked his little nest site. And so the male will sit in the tree within, within eye view uh, line of sight of where he wants to nest and he'll wait for the female to show up and this might go on for two weeks uh, every day you'll see the owl the male owl sitting there and I've watched them so much that I recognize all their faces um, and my wife uh, thinks that's very unusual but I, I can tell you which owl is which just by the way they look because they all have little distinctive faces um, they if the female shows up then the uh, eggs are laid in the middle of January uh, it takes about 30 days, 33 days for an egg to hatch. They usually lay three eggs, but anywhere between two and four eggs is possible. Um, they only breed once a year, not like songbirds. You know, they they uh, they they once a year breeders, and you know they spend a lot of time with their eggs, uh, with babies. Barred owl spends about half its year doing something, raising their family, and they do that every year of their life, which uh, usually is about a maximum of eight years in the wild. Uh, one out of five barred owls uh, live to their first birthday in our area. I don't know about Florida, but one out of five will make it after year one. Um, March through April, after the babies have hatched, the parents will feed them in the box for three weeks or so until they get up enough nerve to jump out or in the tree cavity, wherever they are. And they'll jump out about three weeks after they hatch. Um, every day around about an hour before sunset, you'll hear the male 
who will be outside guarding the cavity and a female who will be inside sitting on the eggs, they'll holler at each other one time, at least where we live. Uh, they'll both go out and get some food and come back. And then they just start over again the next day. And they do this through sub-zero temperatures, um, through hot temperatures, anything. They are completely dedicated to these, uh, to these chicks. It's really a story of survival to watch these animals. And I've seen them through freezing cold. I've seen them in super violent thunderstorms. Uh, they will not leave that cavity um, unless they're killed. I mean, they are 100% dedicated to their offspring. And then after the, the babies fledge, if they survive, um, you'd be surprised how many are killed in the process of fledging, uh, especially in an urban area where people run their dogs and stuff through them. But for the next three or four months, they uh, teach the babies how to hunt. So it's quite comical to watch uh, these little juveniles and their parents, they'll try to eat turtles or they'll try to eat rocks or something. And the parents will teach them what they can and cannot eat. That's a lot of fun. So I'm briefly going to go through uh, the years of the development of this family. And then when we get to 2021, we're going to take a little more time. But in 2017, down here on the bottom right was the only known um, nesting area for the owls. And there's an owl box in that red circle that was 25 feet up. They'd been there for several years before that, and it had plenty of families before. And when I started taking care of the preserve that year, I saw this one male owl sitting in the pine tree, staring, same pine tree he sits in every year, uh, staring into the box. The female never showed up that year. So I'm not sure what happened. Uh, the female was, was killed, obviously. Uh, but but the male sat there for three weeks in the same spot waiting for this uh, female to show up. So it was kind of a bad, bad year for the first year. In 2018, we had a second um, found site uh, cavity for the birds up there in the in the north part, right on the edge of the creek. And um, this is the same male that was in the last video sitting in the same tree waiting on the female to show up at the at the known box. Um, and it did not show up again. So he determined that it was time to find a new mate. Uh, so they did not get successfully bred in the box uh, in 2018. But nearby, uh, these are two uh, juveniles. Uh, well, that's an adult there, but they were teaching the kids what to eat. And if you notice, she was just holding a, uh, some sort of big plum or something. And this one's trying to pull the guts out of a turtle. Uh, you know, gr gruesome, but Turtle is not the number one choice for owls to eat, but it was fun to watch the uh, parents of the nearby family teaching their kids what they could and couldn't eat. Um, this is one of the juveniles about four months out sitting on a bench at the uh, nearby park. Um, uh, you know, I just thought you might be interested to see that. They're very, very inquisitive, very curious birds, and, and they are very gentle also. So the juvenile was learning how to eat here in the... Uh, nearby the nature preserve. So 2019, uh, we went back to just one known area in the cavity here in the uh, owl box. And finally, mom and dad showed up. This is the new mother. Um, and she's got a crawdad in her mouth. And you guys down in Florida know all about crawdads. But up here, that was a surprise for a lot of people to see this owl jumping in the water and grabbing a crawdad. Uh, and that turned out to be the main diet that this owl was feeding. She had two eggs in the, in the uh, box this year. And this is a new mom, and she was feeding this baby crawdads. I want you to look at the legs on this animal and see how much of that body is just a giant set of muscular legs and talons. To me, it's just fascinating how it's evolved to be a prey capturing machine. Um, she delivered these crawdads. Uh, to the box. This is actually the male of the pair delivering a crawdad to the box. And the box is on the lower right there, obviously. Um, and there he is going back out to do some more hunting. And I watched this all day long for probably three weeks. I was out there. Um, I just took my chair and, and watched. It was a great thing to watch and learn. So the new mommy and the male developed a new family there and had their two little babies. Um, that's the female again. She didn't have an injured eye. It's just closed. She was asleep and uh, looking at me. And there's the two of them together. And you notice there's a striking difference in the way the, the faces of these two animals look. And, uh, you know, I don't know how they look down in Florida, 
But look at the difference in the face of these two, these two critters. And these little dudes uh, carried on that year and raised two successful outlets. Here's one of them. <clears throat> this is about a week after this one hatched. And I don't know if that volume's interfering or not, I'll turn that down. But you can see it breathing rather heavily. And notice the eyelids, they blink from the inside out, the uh, nictitating membrane or the internal eyelid. Ants crawling all over the face of it. So I watched these little babies for a long time. Oh, it's tired, there you go. And if you notice, uh, when you're out looking at owls, they, they can't move their eyes individually. They have to move their entire head, like a lot of raptors, like hawks are the same way. So they'll move their head in a circular pattern to determine the distance to some prey. And then just watching the little inner eyelids blinking out there was just fascinating thing for me. The next year, um, we had nothing in the nature preserve. For some reason, nobody showed up in any of the owl boxes or the cavities. And I can't explain to you why. It was uh, particularly dry that year. And that may have had something to do with it. But in the next door park again, we had the same family there that had two babies. And the ones on the right are the two juveniles about two months after they fledged. And on the left uh, is one of the juveniles and they're learning how to hunt. But in this photo, Notice the, uh, on the left, notice the owl's eyebrows have a distinctive triangular shape. And I'm telling you, when you watch these things, they're all individuals. They're all uh, very different and discernible from each other. And when you watch them every day, you really start to recognize all of them. I don't give them names because I do a lot of rescue work for the Chattahoochee Nature Center up here. And, you know, amorphizing the animal or, or giving it a name uh, just leads to heartache when it, and they end up dead. So I try to, to not get too personally involved, but it's hard not to love these animals. I mean, when you're watching them. And again, look at the size of the feet on those juveniles on the right. It's just an amazing thing. And they will grab on and you can't get them off. If they wanna grab you and hold you, you're not gonna peel them off your arm. And here they are kind of checking things out. And this is in the park next door because in 2020, we, we had nothing in our nature preserve as far as owls go. And you see his head moving around his or her head. They're kind of, oh. <laughs> and if you're getting overloaded with barred owl photos and videos, then you're in the wrong place because there's going to be a lot more of them. So that's the moving of the head to try to determine the distance. And look how thick that brow is all the way around the face of this owl. To me, these are awesome. Okay, so 2021 shows up. We had a great year in 2021. The uh, box, the actual wooden owl box on the bottom right, uh, the male and female were back there and they had one baby that survived. But the big story that year was on the left side. And this is where Ralph comes in. So on the left side, the red circle is just a wooded area with no box or anything. We've never had a family there before. And all of a sudden, um, that's not correct. They did have one baby at the box. But all of a sudden, on the uh, left side of the preserve, this family shows up. And this is the top of a tree that was broken off 30 feet up. And it had been broken off for several years, and it was almost rotted. Um, but the next thing you know, there's a barred owl family in the top of this tree. Uh, they laid eggs, had two babies going in there. And it's really an unlikely place because right next to it was a, a tree 10 feet away that was about 30 feet higher than this that had a red-shouldered hawk's nest in it with babies also. And um, that was a tenuous relationship, let me tell you. Uh, but this nest had two healthy babies by the time we found it because we didn't even see it going on at all because nobody was looking on that side of the preserve. And um, there he is doing his little baby owl thing, totally open to the elements. You've got English ivy overtaking the nest already, uh, covered in bugs and ants and stuff. <laughs> so there's the other baby in the back, if you can see it. So this was quite a hit. We uh, 
found out about this and put the word out. The next thing you know, we had 20 or 30 people um, on the street, which was, you could see this, these babies from the street. And it was so crowded there uh, nightly that I had to put up some yellow caution tape uh, to keep people from going in there and hitting the tree and doing stupid things. And we even had a CNN reporter out there uh, covering the story. This picture I, is, I think is my favorite from that entire year. Um, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is a giant koi goldfish that the mother is feeding to the babies. So the next door neighbor's pond, a couple of houses down, had a several high dollar, uh, very fancy koi. And they did not have several high dollar, very fancy koi by the time these houses were done being raised because the mother would just bring a big koi over there. And again, people were real surprised to see these barred owls eating fish and going into the water to get prey. But I could tell you from watching them, they will eat whatever is available. It's mostly uh, birds, small birds like cardinals, uh, woodpeckers for some reason are a favorite, I guess, because they're easy to catch. But they will eat crawdads, they will eat snakes. Uh, they won't eat anything big like a bunny or, or a full grown cat, but they will eat small cats. Um, somebody was talking about a duck. Uh, it'd be almost impossible for a barred owl to go down and get a full grown duck uh, and kill it. But they will eat prey that's been freshly killed, like a squirrel that gets ran over in the road or something. During uh, baby feeding season, they will go and eat uh, freshly killed prey and take it back to the nest also. So there's the, the baby trying to swallow the koi, <clears throat> which I think was pretty awesome photo. It never was able to swallow that particular koi. Okay, so we'll watch this video and see what's in it. gets better here in a minute or two or does it hmm let me go back and try to reload that slide all right we'll move to the next slide this was the high point of that year this is Catherine dudek who runs the chattahoochee nature center wildlife rehab and in that bag is ralph who is a barred owl that was abandoned <laughs> from a nest in North Georgia. And barred owls are really, really good about adopting new babies. And we brought this barred owl down. It was about the same age and about the same size. And I was holding the ladder and Catherine, uh, who is more nimble and younger than me, climbed up and put Ralph right in the nest with him. And of course, as soon as she got up there, one of the babies jumped out and I had to go get it and put it back in the nest. But um, this is about 25 feet off the ground. And Catherine Dudek does this uh, every day, uh, just about. She's uh, either saving an animal or re returning an animal to the wildlife, and she's my hero. And again, she runs the wildlife rehab at Chattahoochee Nature Center. So there's Ralph in the nest. And a little story when, when that's Ralph looking at us. When Ralph was first put in there, there was probably 50 people on the street watching this. And you could hear people cheering and all that. And then when she got done, um, all of a sudden people started wondering, you know, what happened to Ralph because one of the other babies came up and I didn't get this on film, but the other babies were eating something that was white and fluffy and, uh, looked a lot like, like Ralph. So we thought for a little bit there that the babies had begun to eat, had killed and eaten Ralph. Um, and people were crying. It was crazy, man. People were like, oh my God, oh my God. And it turns out that the mother had brought a red shouldered hawk baby in there before we even put Ralph in. And they were actually all three of them eating the red, the red shouldered hawk baby. So Ralph had a really uh, rough start to life. And here's mommy feeding all three of them. Ralph's uh, in the bottom there. And the other two normal babies are up there. And yes, this is half of a squirrel. And this is one of the examples uh, where the mother went and got this freshly killed squirrel because the squirrel is pretty much, you know, I mean, a small squirrel they might be able to kill and wrestle down and get, but they're not going to go after a full size squirrel when other food's available because it would be too much for them to bear. So anyway, um, these are the three babies and you can imagine how, how full that nest was uh, with, with an adopted baby owl and uh, the two existing babies. But we kept watching, we kept watching, everything was going great. And, you know, every day they're getting a couple of days older. They're jumping out and trying to experiment. Um, 
there's the oldest baby. He, he wants to go. I mean, people were cheering on the road. It was amazing how much this brought the neighborhood together and people were standing out on the street uh, just watching this every night. And it was, it's just, Oh, there he goes. Took off. See you later. So that's the fledging. I may let that go a little bit longer. Um, their natural thing they do when they jump is they hit the ground and they go for the nearest tree. And this is how all barred owl babies uh, fledge. They get to the nearest tree they can find and they start climbing that tree. And I don't know why, but that's just what they all do. So once they get up the tree a little ways, when they get to a branch, they will sit on that branch uh, for, for a few days and the parents will still feed them on that branch. And you can see this owl climbing the tree with its beak and its feet. And it's just an amazing thing to watch. And people are cheering and some people are crying. You know, it's just, it's just an awesome thing. Can you imagine if, if when we were born, you know, we had to jump out the hospital window and find the nearest building and start climbing for survival? It'd be insane. So there, it keeps going, it keeps going. It's trying to climb, it's trying to climb. It was just an incredible thing to watch. I kind of spin up, speeding up the video just a little bit there. And if you notice on the center right, that's the parent. The mother is waiting to make sure that baby's okay. I mean, they're watching them all the time. You can see her face now. She's saying, come on, baby, get a little bit higher. They are 100% dedicated parents to these babies. We'll go a little bit further in the video. And there's the other two going, uh oh, what happened? That's Ralph on the lower left. Uh, he was a little bit smaller than the other two. But now they've got more room in themselves and they'll sit there and they usually fledge in the order they were hatched. So uh, the babies will hatch usually a day apart and they'll fledge that same distance apart. Anyway, I could go on and on forever with these, but we'll keep moving. Here's a night vision video of the parent coming back and feeding the babies. I hope I'm not putting you guys to sleep with owl videos, but I just love these owls. I love watching them and I love learning about how they behave. So it's got a piece of something and it's probably a baby rabbit. Um, this is in the middle of the night, it's pitch black and I'm using an infrared sensitive camera to record uh, mommy feeding them. There's a baby up there. Notice their eyes, just like mammals and dogs, they have a reflective rear uh, retina that bounces all the light back out through their iris again, so they get twice as much light. And we don't have that in our eyes, but most animals do. And that's why they always appear, you know, shiny or whatever at night when you shine into them. Okay, so there's another couple photos that were taken of the two remaining children there's one just about to fledge notice uh, all these these uh, babies before they go and for a couple of weeks after they don't have any tail feathers um, that's the same thing with hawks so when you're when you're seeing these uh, freshly fledged critters if you look a lot of times they'll they'll be colored like an adult but if you look and see they don't have any tail feathers yet that tells you that they're freshly out of the nest just a few months um, from it and here's the uh, mother feeding one of the fledglings. It looks like a part of a squirrel maybe, but they do this for another three or four months. They will feed the babies and teach them how to hunt at the same time. And it's really a dramatic thing to watch. Um, and a lot of birds do this, but when the owls do it, it's just magical. And people are always in love with owls. People, people lose their mind over owls. And I've seen many people that just, all they want to see is owls. They don't even look at any other bird. But you can watch this go on for several months after the baby's fledge. And there's the other, the other one waiting to go. This is kind of sped up. Let's scoot it along a little bit. That's the last baby waiting to go. All right. So that was the mother from that nest. And then this year, 
uh, we had babies in the um, original cavity on the bottom right, the original uh, owl box. And then we did not have, they did not revisit the nest in the top of the tree because it was just too dangerous with the red-shouldered hawk right there with them. And for whatever reason, they didn't go back there. This was the remnants of that nest where Ralph was raised this year. And you can see all the bones and body parts from a lot of the prey are still sitting in the bottom of it. I was expecting to see a fish skeleton in this photo, but did not. <clears throat> and if you look at the top left of the nest, there's some kind of rarely or rather large vertebral structure from some sort of animal in there. I'm not sure what it was, but it turned out to be a great planter. And this is the parent. This is inside the owl box. I had some cameras installed during the uh, summer, climbed up there and, and hooked up some USB cameras. And then I could take my laptop and just uh, watch them from the ground. That's the mother sitting on top of the eggs. And that's the father watching the box, okay? And then this year, there were apparently a lot of frogs available in the nearby water source. So this is dad bringing in a large leopard frog to feed the babies. And there's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of gruesome, sorry. But this is the dad leaving with uh, the hindquarters of a squirrel, or at least half the hindquarters of a squirrel. And you can see his talons are just covered in, in prey, and he just looks worn out. You know? But look at the size of those legs again. They do this all day long. The father goes back and forth with food. And then right at sunset, the mom comes out, and she goes and gets some food. They holler at each other once. The mom takes off and gets some food. And then she comes back, and then they return to uh, – feeding these babies just 24 hours a day. And here's inside the box. That's about a five day, six day old hatchling. Just checking life out. Turned out to be three babies in the box this year. And I was broadcasting this on uh, YouTube and Facebook live from the owl box as long as my laptop batteries would last. And it was quite a spectacle. We had a lot of people out there watching these little baby owls. So this went on for quite a while. There's the three owls asleep. They spent most of their time asleep, to be honest with you. Um, look at the size of those talons. I mean, you know, the first thing to develop are those muscular legs and talons. It's just an incredible thing to watch. And every day you would notice some slight difference. There's dad taking off after feeding the baby. You can see in the bottom right inside the hole of the box, there's the baby, you know, like, where's the rest of my food, man? And again, look at the size of these feet. <laughs> so these two uh, developed well. They were pushy and they got most of the food. And the third baby in the center here, if you notice, is a little smaller and didn't do quite as well. And that's very common. There's one of the babies uh, waiting to fledge and the other two in the bottom. And there's the main one with the second one trying to bully his way up there. And, you know, they're pushing for their spot. They're not really ready to go yet. They're too scared to jump, but they want to act like they're jumping. Oh, get out of my way. Okay. <laughs> and this goes on. The getting ready to jump and looking like they're going to fledge goes on for uh, four or five days. And, again, they fledge in the order they were hatched usually. And there's all three of them trying to push their way out. So we'll go over to the next video real quick. Uh, there's dad on the left with a portion of a rat, it looks like, which we have plenty of in the mall next door. And then these are the two babies. The one in the center is already fledged and sitting in the tree and the other one's waiting to go. But again, the parents feed them for several weeks after they jump out of the box. Here's one of them that's picked a nice spot on a tree limb to sit and wait for their parents to feed. And if you notice, there's a lot of weeds and bear, it's still winter time. And the birds, uh, they have a lot of trouble navigating through this stuff. And this is where a lot of them end up losing their lives. They'll get caught in one of these tree limbs or something gruesome like that, and they can't get out. And the parents don't have the ability to go and pick them up 
and move them. You know, if they get in trouble, all they could do is kind of stand next to them and urge them to do something different. Because I've seen uh, on three or four occasions where the owl will be uh, in a dangerous uh, predicament and all it would take would just, a, you know, if the parent would pick it up and move it three feet, it would survive. But they don't they don't do that, I guess, because the talons are so sharp or something. I don't I'm not sure why. But you can see this one's having a lot of trouble navigating all these weeds. And um, there's the second one that jumped out and is climbing the nearest tree. And these trees are all ivy covered and all that. So it was really a dangerous predicament for these owls. And during this uh, fledging period, when the last one that was a little bit smaller decided it was time for him to fledge. I'm sorry to say that uh, this is still the second owl climbing a tree and getting stuck in the ivy, et cetera. I'm sorry to say that the third owl ended up getting caught. Um, there's dad bringing a crawdad. The third owl ended up getting caught in some ivy and died. Um, it was real sad. Uh, you know, I don't have to tell you that. You've all seen dead animals. It's just a horrible thing to watch. And it's just, they're so innocent and you want them to do so well. And then you come out in the morning and one of them is dead laying in a tree. So that's just the way it is. And again, only one out of five of these animals ever see their first birthday. So it was a tough thing for me. Um, the other two had already successfully fledged and I was really hoping for the third one. Um, but the third one didn't make it. So that's, let me go back to that. The third one ended up dying in this privet bush because it couldn't get itself out and it just it just died. Um, as a surprise to everybody there, after that third one uh, died, we were all depressed and we went back up to the front of the preserve and lo and behold, this other set of owls showed up. This is the mother on the left and this is a baby owl that had somehow fallen out of the cavity and the mother was still guarding it and monitoring it. But we saw this the next day after finding the dead little baby in the other nest. So everybody was very excited again because here's this little baby uh, sitting on a tree limb with mommy watching it. And we were all worried about it. I went over and I picked it up and made sure it was healthy because it was only about six feet off the ground. And I put it in a little bit of a higher limb and um, I watched that sucker like a, like a hawk. It's probably the wrong pun to use, but um, this little baby did not look like it was going to make it to begin with, but it did. It kept going and it must have fallen out of that tree a dozen times. And I'd get text messages from people that were at the preserve saying the baby's on the ground. So I'd go over there and get my gloves on and just pick it up and put it back into a tree somewhere in a tree limb. And I actually made a makeshift nest out of a basket and tied it to a tree about 12 feet up and put it in the basket and it stayed there for a couple of days as well. And the next thing you know, um, after several days went by, mom is feeding this new baby. So we were kind of rejuvenated with our, our spirit after seeing this one come around. This one did survive where the other one didn't. And there's noises in the woods. I love those noises. <laughs> okay, so if anybody is uh, interested in, in getting involved in what we do, we don't do any competitive birding. We don't get into all that uh, lifeless stuff. And, you know, let's, let's travel 3,000 miles to see a bird and then leave. Um, my group of, my, my crew kind of hangs out in the local area and we watch things change and we watch little small things happen in our local area. It's a very friendly group. There's no bickering and stuff like that. We just kind of enjoy nature. Um, and we get together on a Facebook group called Sunlit Earth, where we, uh, where we share our photos with each other. And we don't allow any snide comments or any of that kind of stuff. But if you'd like to be involved and you're on Facebook, then go on over to Sunlit Earth. And I hope I didn't bore you to death with my barred owl photos. But that's what I saw in my five years of watching barred owls at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. So they're incredible. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Okay. So, so we have a few yeah. questions. Susan's going to field the questions. I feel like I talked for 10 hours there. You know, it's <laughs> a lot more fun to do this in person where, because I'm a very gregarious person and I like to go back and forth with people. And it's really paralyzing for me to do it on Zoom because you can't see anyone's face or anything else. So what size box do you guys use for the owl boxes? We use a standard uh, same size owl box that you get the plans for at Wild Birds Unlimited or anywhere on the internet. 
Okay. And uh, we built that particular box and it was 16 inches deep by 14 inches wide and 24 inches tall with a slanted roof. Um, they don't need a lot of room. It's like I say, the bird is mostly feathers. Um, you can cram, you could easily put two more babies in that box. Uh, they don't need a lot of room. Now, I think um, Terry Breeze was asking, and this was for, I think you had a camera set looking on the outside looking in it. He said, where did you mount your camera for, I think it was the one Ralph's nest. Um, those were all taken from the street because uh, oh. the, the tree was in a little bit of a recessed area in the preserve. And when he got back up to the street, it was about eight feet higher. So it looked like it was at eye level, but it was not. It was 50 feet away on a street. Uh, and I was using a Canon 600 millimeter. I don't let anybody get close to the nest or anything when those things are going on and I keep people away. But with a with a telephoto, you know, you can get a, an eye level photo. So all those all those photos were taken um, with a Canon 600 millimeter lens from the street. Great, and Liz says, great pics. Thanks for sharing. And Cindy wanted to know, how do you know the difference between a male and a female? Well, you know, that's a great question. And I'm glad you asked that. Um, you don't. And only while you watch them with the babies for several weeks, do you determine uh, there's, it's 100% guaranteed the male is going to sit outside of the cavity and outside of the box and watch all day long. Uh, the male is generally smaller. The female is usually wider and a little taller and more meaty looking, but that's not a guarantee. Uh, there's no, there's no coloration or, or size or anything. There's nothing you can look at and say, that's a female with these, with these animals. But the uh, male sits in the tree and watches the nest. The female sits inside on the eggs. So if one of them's inside on the eggs, you can, you can bet that's the female. How many nesting pairs do you normally find in say a square mile of the preserve? Two. And Two. again, you, you, uh, depending on the food, and when there's lots of food during the year, you may even have three. We've had three pair there in nest before. Um, these owls, like I say, they don't migrate. And when they're born, they don't spread out more than a half mile their entire lives usually. Uh, maximum distance would be four or five miles. And that would be very unusual. And the only reason they would go that far would be if they ran out of food where they were, or if somebody came in and developed the area and tore down their, their tree or something. And I think you had talked at the beginning of the program that the boxes were 25 feet high. Is that correct? Or do you yes. have different? As close as you can get to 25 feet seems to be the right height. And they have to have an open area. It's best if they're facing south. And they have to have an open uh, area in front of them because the owl needs a glide path to get into and onto the box with prey. So it's not going to go around a bunch of trees. Um, it has to it has to have a good 20 30 feet open in front of it uh, and of course near near a food source is probably the number one thing but facing south 25 feet up and when you put these boxes up you may or may not get a family in it i don't know of any way to guarantee it but i can tell you if you paint the box you'll never have an owl in it um, if you put it up and you've used your hands inside it to do a lot of work and you've got smell all over it it's going to be a couple years before that smell goes away um, you will have flying squirrels in the box probably the first year or regular squirrels or uh, in the box. But the less you touch it and the less you alter it, uh, the better it's going to be. Hmm. And how long does it take the juveniles to get their tail feathers? That's what Lori wants to know. About six months. It's, it's oh. pretty weird. They can't fly more than, a, you know, 20, 30 feet for two months after they get out of the box. And it's just, it's lovable. You know, it's, you want to watch them because they just kind of jump a little bit. And when one of them successfully flies over to another tree and claws onto it without hitting the ground, people are cheering for it and everything. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful thing to watch. But the other uh, problem there is that they get killed all the time because they can't fly right and they fall on the ground all the time. And predators know that and they'll, you know, coyotes will eat them. Uh, Off-leash dogs, unfortunately, will eat them. Um, yeah, they, they don't fly very well for probably three months after they get out of the box. Wow. Now, do the owls prefer creating their own nest over a nesting box? And that's a question from Glenn. 
Yeah. Well, they don't create any nest ever. They don't make their own nest of any kind. They find a spot where they feel like laying the eggs and that's it. And there's no preference between a natural cavity or a box that I've seen. Um, and the younger the owl, the, the worse nests they will pick. You know, when you say nest, they're not making any, any sort of nest. If they find a hole somewhere or a flat spot somewhere, then that's where they're going to have their eggs. They don't put any nesting material or anything else. And barn owls in our barn, we have a little property north of here. They'll just find a flat piece of wood somewhere uh, underneath the roof line and just lay their eggs there or lay it on flat concrete. You know, they don't, they don't do any sort of nest building whatsoever. But I'll tell you, I'll, I, let me add to that though, uh, Susan. Uh, the mm -hmm. bottom of that owl box at the nature preserve has got about a five or six inch deep layer of congealed body parts from, <laughs> from all the things it's eaten. And uh, I, I keep, I used to go in there and say, I need to clean that box out this year. And I'll get up there and look in it and it'll just look like a, a layer of brown goo that's, that's just congealed into almost a gelatin. There'll be a couple of leg bones sticking out here or there. But it's a really a soft bottom and it's very, uh, you know, it's, it's accepting of eggs because you're not going to break an egg on there. If you push on it, it feels like congealed <laughs> gelatin, sort of. How's that for a gross ending? <laughs> so Bob wants to know if you have an active program of invasive plant control at the preserve. You better believe it, buddy. And I'm the main one that does it. Um, <laughs> I... I in fact, I'm not standing right now because I blew out my knee a couple of days ago uh, mowing down the bamboo again. Uh, we take great strides and do a humongous amount of labor with volunteers only removing invasive plants. And we also this year um, removed all of our bird seed uh, because the highly pathogenic avian influenza virus is really bad right now. Oh. And over the last few years, it's gotten to where we were putting 120, 140 pounds of seed out on our feeders every week. Uh, we had a crazy amount of birds coming in there, but every year it was some new problem, conjunctivitis, it was uh, some avian influenza. Uh, we would get several dead birds every year. So we decided uh, with a lot of effort this year, I did, that I was getting rid of the feeders and I was going to plant all native bird friendly plants. And we did that. And we're kind of leading the way and I'm hoping some others uh, will follow. Now, of course, if you just got one tiny little feeder in your yard, you're probably not adding much to it. But if you're, you've got eight feeders outside in your backyard, you really need to rethink what you're doing because um, it's just spreading that virus like crazy. And Joyce says, fascinating presentation and wonderful pictures and says best bird chat ever. Oh, come on. Um, <laughs> Cindy wants I'll take it now, though. Thank you. <laughs> Cindy wants to know how big is the hole in the nest box? It's five inches. It's an oval hole that's five inches tall and seven inches wide. Yeah. And um, it's amazing to me that 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 owl can shove itself into that hole. Uh, the one in the box in that in that one was almost circular and it was almost seven inches around. But five by seven is the recommended size. Uh, if you've ever seen a wood duck box, it's about half that size. And that wood duck just crams itself right into that hole somehow. It's really, really crazy to watch. They're Delphi mostly feathers. Said, <laughs> mostly feathers. Awesome presentation and great photos. She'd love to just sit there and take pictures all day. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Karen says, thanks. Kathleen says, great presentation. Very informative from Cindy. Um, Karen says, this explains a lot of what I've witnessed at the nesting box near our yard. She appreciates the information in the videos. Yeah. Well, um, usually my, my presentations are full of a lot of physics and a lot of uh, calculus equations. So I was a lot happier with this one than normal also. So uh, you, if you think this was a snoozer for some of you, you should sit through my solar spectroscopy lecture. Oh, God. I think I'll stick to the owls myself. But... <laughs> We, if you really show your love and appreciation. I do um, love these birds. Karen I do love watching to watch the owls. And, and I really love sharing that. it with people who've never seen it before. It's so much fun to take someone out, uh, especially someone who's stressed or someone who's got a problem in their life and just take them out and show them what you love and just be genuine and honest and sincere with them and just go try to show them what makes you feel good. And it's amazing to watch that effect that that will have on somebody. Um, and I could go on and on about that forever, but 
it is an amazing thing to take someone with you. Yeah. Um, and then also there was a question, does it matter what kind of a tree it goes on to? No. Perfect. Um, You'd have a hard time yeah. nailing an owl box to a cedar tree because <laughs> there's a branch every four inches, but it does not matter what kind of tree it is on. Uh, I will say that the male owl invariably at our nature preserve, they always sit on pine trees. I never see them on any other kind of tree. They always mm -hmm. sit on the pine trees, probably because they have needles all year long. You know, they're, they're evergreens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Anne wanted to know if you could post your Facebook page again. Sunlit sure. Earth. Sunlit Earth. Here, I'll type the link right into the chat room. How about that? There you go. And, then and we are a uh, registered nonprofit in the state of Georgia and the federal government. We've been uh, a 501c3 for 12 years. So it's all legitimate up and up, no salaries paid, et cetera. We just teach science and nature. Good. And then com slant roofs. Is the ivy that was around that, um, is that an invasive species ivy yes. for you guys? Yes. Yes. English ivy is. We also have Virginia creeper, which looks a lot like English ivy, and that is mm -hmm. um, not an invasive. Um, but it's really hard to pull off the English ivy without without killing the Virginia creeper. We also have a type of bamboo here called river cane that's that's native to Georgia, and that kind of shores up the banks of the creek. So I have to be really careful when I'm mowing down the bamboo that I don't take out all the river cane. Oh, yeah. ah, interesting. That's a native. Yeah. The, it's called, I'm not sure what the taxonomy is, but the, the common name is called river cane and it, it grows all over the place here. Arendaria, remember? Arendaria. Okay. Is that what it's called? <laughs> it's not, I'm not a plant person, so. Yeah, this question, how can they climb a tree without ivy? Yeah, the ivy is really a hindrance to them climbing a tree. These little babies and the adults have talons that are humongous and very, very sharp. They could climb up the side of the hardest oak tree ever with no problem. But the uh, ivy was a real hindrance. And I, I, you know, didn't show a lot of the problems they were having. They would get caught in the ivy or they'd get caught in the privet. And I've, I've had to pull them out of there several times. I really try not to interfere, but it is heart wrenching to watch one of these little baby owls climbing a tree and end up getting stuck upside down or something in a bunch of ivy and then the ants get all over it. So I will, I have interfered many times in nature, but you know, I love these birds and I, I'm not going to sit there and watch one of them get killed. That's okay. I'm, I'm good for that. I saw it's it. the yellow jacket. I'll watch the yellow jacket get killed. I don't have a problem with it, but. Uh, <laughs> All right. Very good. All right. And Paula said, when can we go visit? <laughs> Oh, I would love to have you anytime you want. I'm retired and I'll take all of you or any of you on a personal tour of the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve anytime you're in Atlanta. Fantastic. Very good. What I want to know is when can I come visit Lake Apopka, which is going to be as soon as possible. So I <laughs> yes, love that you, place. You have our contacts if we can do anything for you when you come. So, yeah. And I'm, I'm more exciting up. in person. So I'm very animated. So <laughs> maybe when I come down there, we can do something like that in person for the group. Sounds yeah. like a plan. Hey. All right, I'm going to let everybody go. Oh, All right, everybody. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks again, Stephen, so much. Yes, it was perfect. my pleasure. I appreciate the Thank opportunity. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.